Awesome. All right, cool. Yeah. So nice for the introduction. I've met most of you already, but yeah, I'm Ben Muselius. I was to, until recently a PhD student with Jennifer and I'm now a postdoc at the University of Calgary with David Schreimer. So, oh, it's not a good sound. All right, there we go. Um, so in this section, we'll be going through first uh, some things on statistics and then talking about Perseus, which is kind of the sister software to MaxQuant. It's more for data visualization coming out of MaxQuant, though it can be used for other outputs as well. And then talk a little bit about both making data visualizations as well as interpreting data visualizations um, and some of the tools that are available to you for that. So to start off, I want to ask a very straw man type question of why statistics is important to science. So often, especially on the biology side, I know there might be a little bit of a different inclination here as this is a bioinformatics uh, workshop. But often we kind of take the statistical tests and things we do for granted. They're just kind of part of the pipeline. They're a black box. We slot things in. We hope to get nice numbers out. So statistics as a tool set does a couple things for us, does many things for us, but I've oversimplified it into kind of three points. So the first is it gives us standardized methods for comparing effects, right? It means that you're using the same methods as I'm using, no matter where we're located globally, and we don't have to worry about that. The second is for quantification of difference. So we can generally look at something and say, yeah, that looks different, that doesn't look different. But how different is different? It gives us a standard method for quantifying that size of difference. The final thing is extrapolation. We tend to do this a little bit less in proteomics. However, statistics does give us tools for potentially predicting what might happen based on data we have already gathered from somewhere. Nice, it's working out. All right, so how do we use statistics? So I've kind of boiled this down again into a couple of questions we may wish to ask in the field of proteomics or kind of omics in general. So how are we sure to, how, wow, how sure are we that two things are different or the same, right? This is kind of our fairly standard question, right? We might do a t-test, see if two groups are significantly different. Other questions, how certain are we something will happen, right? Statistics can be predictive as well. We can predict the potential outcome or the probability of an event, as well as what are all of the possible outcomes. And going back to the other question, which one is the most likely, how likely are each of the outcomes? And what statistics does is it gives us a set of numerical methods for approaching these things. So it's no longer a hand wavy argument of kind of likely or about likely. It allows us to assign probability values to things and um, have a method for calculating those probability values. So out of interest, because it is a bioinformatics type workshop, how many of you have a fairly good background in statistics, math, stats and stuff? Okay, interesting. <laughs> Some, all right. Very cool. So I basically what I've set up is I want to go through some of mostly some of the underpinnings of statistics. So how do we get from, you know, people who are very number crunchy doing distributional theory and things like that to us using it in statistics for biological side of problems. And I think it's important to at least on the biology side, even if it's not something we do every day to understand where the methods we use come from, because that then allows us to troubleshoot those methods. And if something goes wrong or something looks wrong, either in our own analysis or our colleagues kind of figure out what might be happening. So how do we apply statistics? So the general kind of guiding principle in statistics, thank you very much, is that we assume that our collected sample is representative of a population. So this idea kind of goes back to what Florence talked about in the afternoon yesterday of randomization and collecting our samples, right? The first thing we want to do is when we're measuring an effect, we want to make sure that we are not creating that effect by something we're doing when we're sampling. Um, so often statistics will talk about a population. So we define a population as all possible occurrences of something happening. And this builds into the idea of, okay, well, we have a population. This is kind of like an infinitesimal of all of the occurrences of something in the universe, right? Then when we go to sample something, we have what we call the sampling frame. So the sampling frame is of those kind of theoretical values. What are the ones that we can actually collect with our sampling method? And then kind of one level down, we have our actual sample, which is the values we've collected. So this can take many forms. In our case, doing omic stuff, specifically proteomics, this could be 
measurements of the expression of a protein or the abundance of a protein in a more epidemiological sense, right? This could be instances of a disease, well, but the principle remains the same kind of no matter where we're applying it. Um, yes, so this idea of populations is how we then move into the idea of saying is something significantly different or not. So I'll talk more about the idea of p-values and probability densities, things like that. But really what we're saying when we say something is significantly different is we think that it belongs to a different population than the other, than say our control group. So we're saying that it's not random variation that's causing any differences we're seeing. Instead, we are sampling values that belong to, you know, oftentimes you might think of like a treatment group, right? The treatment is having an effect. It, is ha it has a different treatment population than the control population. Right. Sorry, I realize I'm kind of like blitzing through ideas here. I really want to give like an overview of kind of like how we get to the statistics that we use. Um, but if you want me to elaborate on something, definitely let me know. Or if something doesn't make sense, same there. So we know, I'm sure you're all familiar with the idea of statistical tests. And generally in undergrad, if you've taken a statistics course, these are things that you can hand crank. They're nice, neat, um, generally fairly nice, neat formulas. So the way we kind of boil things down to that point is many populations and phenomena that we want to model will fit into naturally occurring distributions that we know things about. So for example, on the bottom here on your far right, I have a bunch of normal distributions. They're all normal distributions. They just have different parameters. On the left is a chi-square, mostly to show that there are different types of distributions as well. So when we talk about the probability of something occurring and we talk about using a distribution, what we're really talking about is the area under the curve. So we'll say that observations for a certain outcome, say form a normal distribution, and then based on our X value, right? Or whatever kind of X axis our normal distribution is set over, we can then compute how likely the outcome is, right? When we have these, they're called probability mass functions, we set the entire area under them to one, right? One in probability basically says the event is going to occur. We can then subsection this into decimals to say how likely the event is going to occur. Um, yeah, and again, these distributions can look like anything. They can look fairly funky. Um, if you want to get really advanced, if you're modeling something that does not have a normal or a well-defined distribution, it is theoretically as easy as integrating the area under the curve. However, if any of you have done more calc-sided things, that's sometimes not particularly trivial to do. And so that's kind of the hand wavy background. This is kind of where we start to get into more things we would actually care about day to day doing bioinformatics. So when we talk about using statistical tests, t-tests, ANOVA tests, whatever we may be using, we say that these tests have assumptions. And these assumptions are derived from the idea that these tests come from complex distributions that we've assumed things about to make it a simple equation. So the assumptions are basically saying, OK, our data needs to have these attributes for this test to work. Um, Let's see. Yeah, that's where we get distributions. So for example, on the far right hand side there, I'm sure you're all familiar with or at least tangentially familiar with what a t-test equation looks like. It's not particularly um, nasty looking. The guy over on the right there is the equation for the probability mass function that a t-test uses. So if you wanted to get really advanced and skip some steps, you could fill in your information into that equation and integrate your area under the curve. But we can also assume things and just plug it into a t-test, which is far nicer. Um, yeah, I want to, sorry, I get, I realize I'm jumping around a lot, a lot of different ideas. So again, this was also mentioned by Florence, but it's important when we're talking about statistics as well. And that is the idea of replicates. So Florence mentioned three types. I have two types here because these are kind of the types we run into most often. So these are technical replicates and biological replicates. Um, so technical replicates basically being repeated sampling of the same thing, right? Say I have a mouse liver that I'm working with or working with like a, mouse, a liver pathogen. If I take one mouse, sample the liver three times, those are technical replicates. Generally, the idea being you're sampling a biological unit 
multiple times versus biological replicates, you're, sep you're sampling separate biological units. So in this case, multiple mice. Um, yesterday, someone had a really good question about like immortalized cell lines, because technically like all HEC293 cells are HEC293 cells. So they're like could be considered one biological unit. The idea there, so I think the better way to think about this is think about where sources of variants can affect a sample. So the kind of biological replicate level for say HEC293 cells or HeLa cells or whatever would be your Petri dish, right? You're sampling each Petri dish once. Um, if you think about it, there's kind of more variants that can occur to a bunch of different Petri dishes, right? One could be higher in the incubator, lower in the incubator, you put slightly more media in one, whatever, right? There's more variants there as opposed to sampling the same Petri dish three times. All right, another kind of terminology thing that we talk about in statistics is the idea of null and alternate hypotheses. So we look up a statistical test to say, oh, the null is this, the alternate is that. So quite simply, the null is what we say to be true if our significance threshold is not met or exceeded, right? So this would generally be having a large p-value Two groups aren't different, those kind of things. The alternate is what we say to be true if our significance threshold is met or exceeded. This is generally, so the significance threshold, this is very often 5%, so a p-value of 0.05 or less. However, that is a somewhat arbitrary measurement. As long as you have a reason to, you can set your p-value to whatever you like. Um, kind of a terminology thing, so by default, um, we, we assume that the null hypothesis is true. And again, terminology wise, we don't accept the null or switch to the null. We say we reject, or sorry, the alternate. We, we say we reject the null hypothesis if we have significant evidence for the alternate. All right, talking now about p-values. So I kind of already mentioned this, but two types of p-values to be aware of. The first is the calculated p-value. This is what R or your statistical software spits out to you. Um, it's basically calculated generally by the area under a distribution, going back to that idea, for whatever circumstances you are testing or have input into the software. The second kind of p-value you might hear is the critical p-value or confidence level. Again, this is generally 0.05. This is how confident we say that we want to be doing the test to say that there is an effect or things belong to two separate populations, whatever the alternate hypothesis of the test is. All right, another kind of technical thing, so type one and type two errors. So with any statistical test, right, there's always a chance we're wrong. It's, it's a probability thing. We can we say we'd like to be 95% sure. Well, five, that means 5% 5 of the time we're wrong. So we've put names to different types of being wrong. So these are broadly separated into type one and type two errors. So type one errors are when we reject the null hypothesis when it is correct. So this is a false positive, right? What I, the populations turn out not to be separate even though we thought we had enough information to say, hey, these two populations are separate. This is causing an effect, whatever the test might be looking at. Type two is simply the opposite of that. We fail to reject the null hypothesis when we should, re should reject it, and this is a false negative. So moving then into some of the tests that we commonly use in proteomics, these are tests that are generally baked into the software that you guys will be using, like Perseus, Proteome Discoverer, um, just anything, Spectronaut as well, anything that has a visualization component will have the capacity to do these tests. So t-test is probably the one everyone is the most familiar with. So t-test has the null hypothesis that the groups belong to the same population or are not different, right? We'll say we have a clinical trial, for example, right? This would be saying, the null hypothesis would be saying that our treatment has no effect, right? Our treatment isn't doing anything on the parameter that we're testing. The alternate hypothesis is that the groups belong to different populations, so they're different. This would be saying that our treatment is doing something. And on the right um, is the, again, t-test is a normal distribution. It uses a specific t-distribution. Um, it's, there's a couple different ones overlaid there. What governs it is the degrees of freedom. Um, I guess this is kind of a good opportunity to mention. So 
When you talk about degrees of freedom, this is directly related to the number of replicates we have in a test. And I think it goes without saying, right, the more replicates we have, the better data we're going to have, the more sure we are of our observations. Um, I believe it was Jennifer Flens, I don't remember who, they mentioned that in proteomics, we tend to like to have at least four replicates. More is better, especially for more complex systems. In terms of statistical tests, you want to have at least three replicates to really do statistics. You can, numerically, you can do it with two. However, the it's considered an invalid test. Um, if you kind of really briefly think, so we're using the idea of distributions. If you have a single point, that's not a distribution, that's just a point. If you have two, it's just a line. Again, it's just the distance. If you have three, it's not a very good one, but you start to have more information about the distribution you're modeling, at least enough to do a statistical test. Um, going back to t-tests, so there are a couple of different variations on a t-test, and these get, allow us to employ them in different ways. So the most common ones would be a student's t-test and a Welch's t-test. The only difference between these is how we estimate the error in the test. So a student's t-test has the assumption that your two errors or uh, sigma squared values are the same, which um, is sometimes too true, is sometimes not, where Welch's t-test calculates the error for the two groups are testing against each other separately. A fairly good rule of thumb is that if you have a decent number of replicates, you're not really penalized for using a Welch's t-test over a student's t-test so it's not a bad idea to do so if you basically the only thing you sacrifice for a welch's t-test in statistics whenever we estimate something we lose a degree of freedom so if you have a very low number of replicates then it's a little more worth kind of considering between a student's and a welch's t-test the final one is paired so paired basically allows you to test a bunch of assumptions indirectly against each other the easiest way to explain this would be thinking of a growth curve, right? So if we want, we can use a t-test to compare if two growth curves are significantly different from one each other. However, if you think about it, you don't really want to test the value of your time zero point against your 24-hour time point. So what a paired t-test allows us to do is exactly what it says in the name. It allows us to pair off values but get a single p-value out. So only values from the same time points would be tested against each other. Again, it doesn't have to be time points. It can be any situation where you have pairing. You can use a paired t-test. And then assumptions. So this test assumes both normality as well as independence. So normality, because we derive it from a normal distribution. If your parent distribution, if your data does not look like that, um, it'll still give you a number out. However, it's just an invalid test. Same with independence. Independence ties into sampling. It is the idea that knowing information about what And that's kind of the experimental design side. Most, most times you won't really have to worry about that. And then I have equal variance here as well for these two, but not the Welch, because that's what's special about the Welch. Non-parametric tests. So another thing that we can use um, are non-parametric tests. Non-parametric simply means that we, they're not derived from a distribution. So you definitely will run into times where your data doesn't nicely fit one of these natural distributions that we know a lot about and have a lot of nice equations for. So there's different types, there's well, many different non-parametric tests. Um, of course, their assumptions reflect this, right? They generally don't have this assumed normality here or whatever the parent distribution is. A um, couple of examples. So the, there's the Mann-Whitney U-test, which serves a very similar function as a t-test, as well as the Kruskal-Wallis test, which serves a very similar function as an ANOVA test. Speaking of ANOVA, so ANOVA is a very good test for paring down lots of data quickly. So ANOVA is an analysis of variance, and ANOVA works off the principle that groups that have more in common to one another than to the population at large will have lower variance in between them, right? It's quite an easy test to visualize um, kind of in your head. If you think about it, you have kind of a population that takes up this size. You might have a group within it that takes up like this area on a plot. That group is going to have 
a lower variance, right? Because it's a smaller area on the plot than the entire group at large. And that is the principle that ANOVA works off of. ANOVA's actual um, test um, hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is that there is no difference between the groups and H, um, the alternate is that there is at least one significantly different, different group within the ones you're testing. The interesting thing about ANOVA, so ANOVA is actually derived from an F distribution. Um, you can test multiple groups at once in ANOVA. That's kind of how it differentiates itself from a t-test and get out a single statistic. So that's why kind of the thing here with the alternate hypothesis is that it only tells you one of the groups is different. It doesn't actually tell you which one, at least in that F statistic output that the test or that the true ANOVA test is based on. So it's good for like taking huge sets of data. If nothing's different in it, maybe it's not worth you continuing your analysis on it. Um, this is often followed up by pairwise t-testing. So that would be, okay, at least one group's different. Well, it's not really beyond data filtering. It's not great for us to say, okay, one group's different in here. We want to know which group is different. So we'll go through and do pairwise t-test to find out specifically where that difference is. Um, and yeah, that's more hypothesis testing. So, yeah. Um, I noticed that we have um, the same group in each group. Yep. And some of them, they are they produce a significant effect for, let's say, a visible effect. Sure, yep. But if you modify which treatment is being included in the ANOVA analysis, the significance of those results change. But the average is just still the same. So can you provide some insight? Yeah, so again, if you think about kind of that spatial idea with ANOVA, right? Let's say you have, so you see you have 10 treatment groups, say nine of them all cluster over here and your 10th one clusters up here. The way ANOVA works is it takes a ratio between the group variance, uh, or sorry, between, yeah, between the group variance and the entire sample variance. So if you suddenly exclude this group up here, your sample variance is suddenly just this area over here. So it's modifying of the sample variance if those remaining nine tests are still present in the ANOVA. Cool. So multiple hypothesis testing. Statisticians aren't particularly inventive when they name things. It's exactly what it sounds like. It is testing multiple hypotheses at once. So, so a couple examples of this are pairwise comparison, multiple t-tests like I already talked about, basically looking through a bunch of values at once. This is very prominent for us in proteomics because most times, unless you're doing something like PRM or a form like MRM, you're testing thousands, if not tens of thousands of proteins at once. So you very much have multiple hypotheses you're testing. And the reason it's so important for us is we have to deal with something called false discovery rate. So this is going back to the idea of type one and type two errors. And this is the rate at which we make those errors in a large group. So if you think about for a moment, just kind of how probabilities work, right? We can find the probability of two events occurring together by multiplying their probabilities together, right? I have two 99% chances. I can multiply 0 0.99 and 0 0.99 together um, and get the probability of both of those events occurring. So quick thought experiment. If you apply that then to a 95% confidence interval, your 95% something sure or want to be 95% confident something is going to happen. If you start repeating that many, many times, multiplying 0.95 by 0.95, suddenly your, your entire confidence, or we call it family-wise error rate, becomes much lower than 95. So I don't think, no, I do not have it here. But basically, to demonstrate this, you can take 0.95, multiply it together three times, and you end up with about 0.87. So suddenly, your family-wise error rate you're only 87% sure of all of your observations being true. So the idea of false discovery, oh, sorry, I do have it right there. I should read my slide. Um, yeah, so false discovery rate is how do we deal with this? Because that's only three observations. If you have even 200 proteins, right, that number becomes 200. So suddenly you're, the likelihood that you've made a type one error, right, a false positive somewhere, becomes far, far, far more likely. So there's a couple, there's many methods actually of dealing with this, but I'm going to talk about two of the most common ones um, for, that we use in proteomic analysis. So the first is called the Bonferroni method. 
and it's defined basically as A over M, where A is the desired FDR, and M is the desired, is the number of hypotheses tested. And that is basically taking what I used here and just flipping it backwards. Um, this, is, this is very, very conservative because it is quite literally taking that relationship and then applying that adjusted FDR to everything. So you, very, you need very, very, very low p-values, especially in very high sample sizes, to have things be significant with a Bonferroni, which can be good. There can be definitely cases where you want to really filter your values, or you want to be very sure of your differences, but it also causes us to have a high tendency towards type two errors, which is false negatives. So there's a large portion of the data when we do this that we're suddenly missing out on that may actually be different. So there's multiple methods to address this, as I said, but one method that we like to use in proteomics is called a benjamini hochberg uh, adjustment. So here each observation, or yeah, each observation is assigned a new p-value cutoff based on its ranking compared to other p-values. The smallest p-value is given the lowest numerical ranking. And that's covered by this test here. So I over M times Q, where I is the individual p-values rank, M is the total number of tests you're doing, and Q is your chosen FDR. That's often 0.05. What this does, so the um, lowest, or sorry, the highest ranked p-value will have the same cutoff as all p-values would have if you were using the Bonferroni normalization. However, as the rank decreases, the p-value cutoff becomes less and less and less stringent. Um, and you can, if you um, want to, you can do the mathematical, mathematical arrangement to show that this, the Bonferroni does satisfy that guy there. Or sorry, the Benjamini Hochberg does satisfy that guy there with the rank test. Does that all somewhat make sense? Yeah. Um, I would say the easiest way to think of them is kind of two distinct phases. So you set your parameters, you execute your like max quant or Diane kind of level, um, level analysis. And then what you take from there is your, what you perform your statistics on. If you were doing something like Florence was talking about comparing different, um, different methods of analysis in Diane or max quant, like that was the point of your experiment was to quantify the difference caused by um, the parameter changes, then that would kind of all become one big group. But for the purposes of like, oh, I want to try, you know, taking like match between runs or not taking match between runs, you do those analyses and then treat them as completely different data sets. Does that make sense? Or, okay, cool, no worries. Um, so another thing is what we talk about is normalization. So there's, it's a little bit confusing because there's actually two things that we use normalization for. So the first is exactly as it suggests, a lot of our tests work best with a normal distribution. So we have methods for making non-normal data normal. Um, the biggest thing with this is that we want to still preserve attributes of the data. So we don't actually want to change attributes of the data to make it normal because then there's no point. We've just changed our data. We're just testing random numbers at that point, which is a waste of time. So there are methods um, you'll see in Perseus when we go through, we innately apply a log two transform. Um, this preserves at all the attributes of the data that we care about, but tends to make at least proteomics data a lot more normal. There's other more advanced methods for it. You, there's methods to actually calculate what transform would be ideal for normalizing a certain data set. Um, there's other things you can do. You can like subtract the median, things like that can also help with normalization. Normalization, so, is a somewhat arbitrary thing in 
kind of the natural sciences, there is no data set you're going to get that's going to have a perfect normal distribution. You should probably be worried <laughs> if you do get a perfect normal distribution. Um, so it's kind of a thing you have to eyeball. And the other thing I want to briefly touch on here, I apologize, I just thought I had a full slide up, but that's the idea of robustness for assumptions. So robustness is simply, so we talked about assumptions and there is a certain amount you can break those assumptions. So think of assumptions like a speed limit. A speed limit may say 80. Not many people actually do 80, right? There is an upper limit. You don't want to be doing like 150, um, but there's, it's kind of a range, right? Same with assumptions, right? We, we're in the natural sciences. Nothing's going to be perfectly normal. So there's a certain level of robustness for normality and the other assumptions. Going back to specifically normality, there are tests to test if something is normal. This is called a Shapiro-Wilkes. Um, it exists because mathematically we can do it. There's very little value to actually doing a Shapiro-Wilkes. There's nothing special with the cutoff that occurs. It's um, generally ignored. So the other type of normalization. So th this type of normalization allows us to account for experimental parameters. So for example, uh, TMT is a really good example of this. In TMT analysis, we use isobaric mass tags to label a bunch of protein samples, bring them together, and then on those mass tags, we have a standard channel. We can then use that standard channel to normalize between different runs and allow us to do comparison on them. Normalization is basically the idea of confidently removing any experimental effect that we are sure is experimental, right? So we might say we normalize for whatever effect. It's a really, really powerful tool. However, it's it should be used carefully, right? You should be very sure that whatever normalization you're doing, you're normalizing out error, not actual experimental effect that you're seeing. Imputation. So um, you'll see this afternoon when we look at Perseus and your, if you've already looked at your max quant outputs, we do tend to get some NAN values. So NAN values can be caused by a number of things. Basically what they are is that the software detected a peptide or a protein in one place, but not in other areas of the sample or other samples rather in the run. So we'll just report NAN. That's fine, that makes sense to us as individuals viewing it. However, software really doesn't like NAN values. So we have a couple of ways to deal with this. Um, common conventions include imputing a constant, so you can just bring in a zero, that definitely works, or a different value if something's significant for your experiment, excuse me, for what you're doing. Calculate a value that represents the rest of the data. So this can be common in other types of sampling. You might calculate, um, you might calculate a value that doesn't influence your variance or your mean, but it's just a placeholder value. That's certainly a valid way of doing it. Finally, and the way we tend to do it, at least by default in Perseus, is imputing from a distribution. So we'll actually take our data, or yeah, take the distribution that our data forms, downshift it by I think it's 0.1 or 1.3 and take from the lower tail of that distribution. That gives us a pool of random values to impute or to bring into a place that's missing values. Um, yeah, so especially as you move to different labs, different people have different views on kind of what the best practices are here. My best advice would be know why you've done what you've done and what the implications of it are for your downstream data analysis. Principal component in that, yeah, free. Yeah. I guess like the, the tail end of it. Yeah. Is that the stuff of your entire data set or multiple sequences? I believe it's at the protein level. So if you have like, so if you've identified like a protein group in your uninfected, but your infected is NANs, it'll take the values from the infected group and downshift those and then take from, from there. Of yes. Yeah, that's that's the idea with the downshift is that you basically you want to create noise for your statistical testing, but you don't want to accidentally impute values that are too large and show up as significant. So that's why you do the downshift. 
if anyone is interested in imputation in general, I'm going to put a link to our, a, a lecture from our statistics workshop in Slack. It's all about dealing with this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is this is very much like a crash course trying to hit the high points before we talk about some of the Persia stuff. Um, yeah, principal component analysis. So we so a very important thing, especially when dealing with complex samples like proteomic samples, is when we do our analysis, are the differences we are seeing caused by the experiment we're doing, or are they random differences? So principal component analysis is a very good way for us to look at this. Um, see, do I have the technical definition here? Yes, so the technical def definition for principal component analysis is factors which contribute to variance are represented as vectors along the axis of a p-dimensional epsiloid. Sounds lovely. Um, <laughs> Turns out a p-dimensional epsiloid is very, very hard to visualize and very, very hard to plot. So the what we end up doing is we take the largest of these vectors and plot those vectors. That's how we get the PCA plot. Um, so the magnitude of these vectors is basically the amount in which their corresponding factor impacts the variance. So what that looks like is that guy over there. So you can see on the bottom right, we have component one. On the, on the y-axis, we have component two, and there's percentages assigned to them. And these are the percentage of variance that is accounted for by those components. And as we can see here, they're quite large, 41 and about 20% each, which is really, really good. And two, we can see that the separation, so what you want to look for is component one, which is 41% of your variance, is separating, in this case, a wild type and a mutant proteome. That's the big thing you want to see out of this analysis, is that the largest component is separating your treatment groups, or the, your experimental groups, rather. You want, yeah, you want that to be the reason for the variance in your sample. On the y-axis here, we can see it is the actually between the replicates, so that's pretty good. Um, yeah, dimension. So in terms of actually creating the plot, dimensions are commonly limited to the highest two. You could certainly do three as well if you wanted to, um, but two is kind of the standard. Um, and yeah, we expect to see the differences based on what our experimental, um, what we're experimenting on. So more complex data. So that's fantastic when you're doing something that is very discrete, right? A mutant versus wild type, a simple treatment study. But in proteomics, especially as kind of we get the ability to sample more and more complex samples, we might want to do studies where our first two components really don't tell the whole story. So of course, when you can, when it's possible, it's best to just address this with experimental design and simplify your experiment, right? But in some cases, that is not possible, such as in vivo data. So again, there are different methods for actually doing this, but the one I'm going to mention at least briefly is T-SNE. So T-SNE stands for T-Distribution Stochastic Neighbor Embedding. Again, another riveting name. Um, but what this process does is it takes high dimensional data and compresses as much of that information as it can into two to three dimensions. And the way it does this is basically it looks at or takes dimensions, pairs them off into 2D spaces, measures the similarity between points in that 2D space, and then uses an iterative process to keep as much of that separation with respect to the 2D space onto a 1D line and keeps repeating that process until the data has been compressed down to however many dimensions you want, generally two to three. Um, yeah, I would say beyond that, if you're curious about it, yeah. So when I did this, I tried both and I preferred the results that TSNE gave me, but UMAP definitely um, has, has a place as well. Yeah, that's that's probably the best way to do it. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing to mention with TSNE is it's a little different than something like principal component analysis. Principal component analysis is a very set method. You calculate your vectors, and you're good to go. TSNE is called an iterative process. There's different ways that that uh, dimensional compression can take place depending on the order in which the dimensions are um, basically compared to each other and compressed. 
Um, so this is what's called like a seeded, seeded method. Um, if you do it in R, you can set a seed, which you'll want to do to be able to repeat the same plot um, consistently. Right. So a favorite for presenting proteomics data is volcano plots. So volcano plots consist of a t-test comparing the protein abundance between two groups that you want to compare on one axis and the fold change on the other axis. So the t-test right, takes into account things like our variance, where the fold change is a little bit more of a biological measurement. Um, and to be considered significant, a sample has to be both significant in terms of the fold change as well as the calculated p-value for its change between, say, wild type and infected, or whatever your, um, your situations are. Um, yeah, so in proteomics, we generally set this full change as two. However, again, it's another arbitrary thing. If you have a reason to, you can certainly set it to whatever you want. So this is a right angle volcano plot. This is the log 10 transform p-value on the y-axis, and then effect size would be your fold change on the x-axis. Um, yeah. So a couple things we can do. So especially this intersection here between our x and y cutoffs is somewhat arbitrary. We can improve upon this by giving more weight to it depending on the size of the effect. So what this basically means is that if something has a fold change of like six or seven, even if it has a high enough variance that it's not a significant p-value. As someone who's doing biology, I'm probably interested in investigating what that protein is. Same idea on the very low end. There might be something that doesn't have that large of a full change, but has a very high p-value because it's very consistent, the change. So it's helpful to put more weight as those parameters increase. And that's how we get to the um, volcano plot that some of you might be used to seeing. Yep, go ahead. It is the adjusted p-value. So it's, yeah, so kind of going back again to the idea. Yeah, no, 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 it's a good question. Yeah, so it, it is the adjusted p-value that's used. Yeah, generally with um, a Benjamin Hochberg is the adjustment. Um, so yeah, so what we do is we have what we call a SAM or a significance analysis microarray, and that gives us the nice curves that we see on the volcano plot over there assigning more weight to either the fold change or the p-value depending on how extreme the value is. So as one value becomes more extreme, we require a lower cutoff for the other value. Uh, yeah, and as I said, Benjamin Hochberg, the um, FDR correction was applied to the p-value cutoff as well. And as you may note, so looking at the bottom there, I said uh, a difference of two, but it's a log two scale. So on the actual axis, it shows one. All right, so that was very much a kind of like blitz through some statistical topics. If you require more resources or are interested in kind of exploring these things further, a couple of recommendations. One is that Guelph, JV Statistics, has a lot. He's a professor at the university, a lot of very, very good publicly available resources on things like FDR, T-tests, ANOVA, linear regression, things like that. Um, additionally, StatsQuest for more biological side of things, things like T-SNE, UMAP, um, they have very good videos on kind of how those things actually get done. All right. Do you want me to keep going or do you want like a five minute break to switch to R? Okay, awesome. All right. So um, how many of you use, how many of you have used R before? Okay, okay, almost everyone. <laughs> so this will hopefully be a fairly self-explanatory review. But R is a very good tool for visualizing data. But what R gives us is a platform to basically do whatever we want. A lot of pre-made data analysis platforms, your Perseus, Proteome Discover, Diane, well, not as much Diane as uses R. Um, Spectronaut, things like that. They have a certain array of plots that they can make, but if you're asking certain questions or want to display data in a certain way, um, that may not be sufficient. So R is a very, very good tool. So again, I will move quite quickly because most of you have used R, but if you just go to the website and download it, it doesn't look particularly pretty. It's just the actual console that you download. Um, if you wanted to, you could write your, oh, 
write your code in there or put your R script in there, but it looks quite ugly. So most people will use an IDE or integrated development environment, which is R Studio generally for R, which looks like that, which is a little bit nicer looking. So kind of breaking down what the different windows do. So starting with the top left, which is up here, is the console. So this is where your code is actually executed and ran, as well as where any um, numeric or text-based results will be produced for you. On the bottom left panel, so down here, is where you have the console, or not the console, <laughs> your actual script. So this is where you can import scripts from other people. Additionally, I'll also touch on our markdown language, but this is where our markdown would sit as well. Um, and this gives you a place to save your code, modify your code, work with it, all that good stuff. Over on the right-hand panel is a couple of things. So you have your environment panel, which shows you everything you've created. So this example here, um, I have a bunch of values, some peptides, a Diane data frame, basically anything that you've created in the environment, any matrices, data frames, anything like that, will show as a list there. And you can reference, go back to see what it contains, all that stuff. Um, additionally, up there, if you're creating any visualizations, so any plots, anything like that, that's where your visualization will show up as well. Um, on the bottom, you have your packages. So R is fantastic because it has a great base environment, and then people create all kinds of packages for doing different things. The R Studio IDE gives you a very nice environment to track what you have installed, as well as install new packages and enable and disable packages as you work based on what you're doing and what you want. And that can be, so this shows you just a list of everything that's um, available in the environment, and it's simple as ticking the box and the package will be activated. In terms of getting new packages, there's kind of two ways to do it. So one, and going back here, there is this button for install up here. There's a lot of packages that are kind of curated by our studio. So you can simply go there and then search the package. So in this case, for an example, I have ggplot2, which is a very popular software for doing visualization in R. And you can hit install and it will automatically run everything for you, which is super, super nice. The other way um, to get packages is generally through GitHub. So you can go to GitHub repository and they'll have instructions for actually doing the download there as well. So how to find help are, especially if you're new to it, can be a very confusing place, especially with the way it communicates and lays things out. So I just wanna highlight quickly, generally, no matter what package you're using, if you have a command, in this case here, I'm using Grefel as an example, you can put question mark and then put the command and a nice readout of what the command does and all of the things you can tell the command and how it perceives them will come up for you on the right hand side of our studio. So nice thing to know and can be very helpful. There is also, because R is quite well used, a lot of cheat sheets available. So here's some examples, one for base R for the base package data for um, ggplot2 as well as R markdown. Um, so those are available just by just by Googling. I believe, yes, Florence also attached these three with the workshop material. Um, so those are great resources for getting going. Talking about R Markdown, so R is both a great tool for just working away on your data, but can also be very nice for presenting figures to collaborators. So what R Markdown does is it gives you an environment both where you can make and run code, but also where you can embed figures and make it a little bit more like a presentation. Um, so you can have both, again, both like the actual R code here and run it from the R Markdown language, as well as embed your graphs as well. Um, really nice thing with that is that it could be ex exported in a lot of different formats. So PDF, HTML, Word files that can then be sent to a collaborator for them to review data analysis you've done for them or figures you've made for them. are super versatile for us. Um, again, ggplot2, Diane, many more, depending on what you're doing, there's very likely an R package made to do it. So we'll really quickly touch on this because you guys will get more experience actually using this package. But Diane, unlike um, MaxQuant with Perseus, 
or Spectronauts does not have a visualization suite. So there is a Diane package made specifically for interpreting the Diane outputs, um, which is available. It's not, so it's not actually DIA-NN, it's just called Diane. This is one that's a GitHub download. So I believe it is already in the environment um, on the Amazon Web Service. But if you were doing this on your own, back at your own labs, it's quite simple. You can just go to the GitHub and there is instructions for downloading and using the software as well. All right. So, um, do you want me to do, just keep going? Um, I'll keep going for Perseus and do you want to do visualization? All right, cool. So um, there is a lot of different platforms for doing visualization that are kind of baked into the proteomics ecosystem. So for a couple of examples, Skyline, we've talked a little bit about Skyline. It's very good for MRM, PRM type experiments. It also has visualization tools. You can see your chromatograms, things like that. It can be very, very nice. OpenMS and MS Swath. Um, they're more on the DIA side. However, they do also have some visualization tools and as well as Perseus. So Perseus is, as I said, kind of the start of the talk, a sister software to MaxQuant. So they're developed by the same group in Germany and it's kind of set up to handle MaxQuant data. That said, you can actually put really any data frame into Perseus if you like the way it works. You just have to make sure everything's labeled correctly so it knows what your data is. Yeah, so this is, so if you were actually looking to get Perseus, you Googled it, this is the page you'd come to so you can download it. Um, and it kind of gives you a little blurb on, like a little abstract on what it does. But basically visualization software for proteomics, lots of good integration, lots of kind of preset pathways for things we would like to do with our data. All right, so I'm going to walk through what a standard kind of run through Perseus would look like. Um, and then I'll, you could follow these instructions with the max quant data or output that's on the computer or that you made um, from the max quant lab last night. So first things first, we already talked about this, but version control is a big deal. Software is constantly improving, constantly getting updated. It's important whenever you do work to note the version you're using and also pass that along in any publication or anything you do. Even if you're working with multiple people at a lab, if you have an older version or a newer version, version control is important because there can be changes. And it can change the, the analysis, which is really what we care about. So coming into, coming into Perseus. So you'll see this blank window when you first open it up. The first place you want to go is up here to file, and there will be an option to bring in data, which will bring you to this window here. So here you want to go select and select the protein groups folder or protein groups file rather from the combined folder of the R output. And after you do that, it will auto populate like this. So as you can see here, a lot of different columns uh, that we can possibly bring in. Some of them it will recognize and automatically populate in your numerical, categorical, and text. You can certainly change these if you like. By default, it brings in things like reverse hits, potential contaminants, identified only by sight, um, razor peptides, all that stuff. What we're actually interested in for our analysis is right here, this LFQ intensity. So in this case, with your L4, sorry, L1 through four and R1 through four, you want to bring those in. Really, these would be named whatever you named your runs, right? So if you were doing this in your lab, you called them, I don't know, A through Z, right? You'd see LFQ intensity A through Z. And you would bring those in, and you want to bring them into main up there. So to bring them in, when they're highlighted, you can hit the respective arrows right there. So that would bring them in. If you accidentally brought in something you didn't want to bring in, you could highlight it here and bring it out. Yeah, and that's exactly what we have here. So now all the LFQ intensities are moved over into that main panel. Great. So after you do that, Perseus is really, really good at showing you what you have done. 
So it has the left panel over here where it will show you the actual matrices with your intensities or whatever the matrix contains. In the middle here is the panel that shows you your workflow. So we can see here it's showing us, all right, cool. We imported what it calls a generic matrix. Again, it doesn't have to be from max point, can be from anywhere. And then this is the matrix we have imported. And then it gives us, since we're clicked on it, some stats about the matrix over here, string columns, main columns, how many rows it has, all that stuff. So, so we want to do a couple things to get our data ready for processing. The first is to, uh, to save it and set where we want it to go. So over there. So that's just setting our output there. So we file, you can set your output where you want the files to be saved. The other thing we can do is we can format these matrices to, so we know what they are. Because once you start going, you may have hundreds or many, many matrices, and matrix 32 may not really mean a lot to you. So a matrix here in the center box can be right-clicked, and you'll get this nice panel over here. A couple of things you can do. This is called format. Here where format is written, you can type in whatever you want. You could call your matrix transformed or whatever, whatever makes sense for what you've done. Um, if you want to make it really stand out, you can also set the fill color, which is like the central color of the matrix box here, as well as the line color, which outlines it, if you want it to look nice and fancy. All right, so that now that we're kind of set up, there's a couple of things we want to do to prepare the data. And the first thing is filtering. So in this top, top area is kind of most of the functions that we'd want to do to our matrices. First thing we're interested in, bottom row, third from the right is filter rows. And we want to go filter rows based on categorical column. This allows us to do a couple things. So when MaxQuant looks at the data, it will flag certain things that we may or may not want to include in the data set. So Commonly, we will have some options here. Specifically, you'll want to remove the ones tagged as identified only by site, reverse hits, and contaminants. So basically, contaminants is quite self-explanatory. There's just going to be solvents, other things that the mass spectrometer picks up that you don't really care about analyzing and profiling. Reverse hits and identified only by site um, are basically max quant, different ways of max quant identifying things that we're not as sure about and we generally don't include in the analysis but it gives us the option to if we want. All right, so now that we've done that, we can see kind of how Perseus works. So this is where we started. It now shows us you filtered based on rows, and here's the resulting output matrix. Nice thing we can do, especially for working backwards, if you say you did data analysis two months ago and want to figure out what you've done, if you load this and you click on that, it will tell you exactly the parameters you filtered through, which is really, really nice for recreating or just knowing how the data has been processed. Another thing, so this entire setup can be saved, um, head it back here. Yeah, saved up here as an SPS file. Yeah. yeah just, um, I'm, I'm trying to follow. I, I have uh, a previous open, but I just uh, didn't get like at the beginning how to load the, um, the, the, the first file, the, um, the, the protein one printed from, um, uh, next one. Okay, so I believe so. If you go file, you should be able to. There should be an option to bring in. Bring, oh, sorry, yeah, or the this guy right here below matrix. All right. Yeah, and then you want the protein groups uh, file from the combined folder in max plot. Thank you. Good. Awesome. All right. Yeah, so it can be saved as an SPS file. That's really, really nice because it gives the SPS file contains all, all of this information as well. They can get quite bulky, but it's really nice if you're um, working with someone or sending things to your to a collaborator, your supervisor saying, hey, this is the analysis I did. You can follow my pipeline, make sure everything makes sense. All right, it's filtering. Yeah, and then so same here. So you'll need to do it individually. But so here is for reverse hits, potential contaminants. Um, you'll want to make sure here that it says remove matching rows. So I think there's also options for keep matching rows and split matrix. So those does exactly what it says in the tin, remove matching rows. We've told it reverse. And 
anything that's tagged as being reverse and we want it to remove the rows. Same with potential contaminants and reverse um, identified by site. All right, so yeah, you'll go through that, do the different steps. You should be here. So one, two, three filters. The next thing we wanna do is we want to log transform our data. So that helps with normalization. It also helps with visualization. So when we're dealing with intensities, we'll have a lot of like kind of mid range values and then some values that are super, super high. So if you actually plot that, um, so that's not valid, just the plots don't look great because you just have values that are extremely high and we'll kind of stretch the plot. You'll have a very, very high y-axis. So it also helps with normalization. Generally, log transform is good for normalizing. We, well, a lot of data, but proteomics is one of those types of data. So here on the top panel again, we go to basic and go to transform. And here we can do a couple of things. So this allows us to specify the transform we want if you wanted to. So follow standard mathematical notation. So if you wanted to like multiply by every everything by two, you could certainly do that. It would just be two star X would apply the transform, but it defaults to log two, which is nice because that's often what we want to do. And then you just bring over from here, all of the columns that you want to do that to. In that case, it's our LFQ intensity for both L and R one through four. Yeah. Please don't go too far from the computer. All right, cool. <laughs> I will. Use my mouse. <laughs> All right. So then you can hit OK, and that will do that step. And we can see here, so kind of looking at our left-hand panel, it's easier for you guys because you can click on and see the matrix, but you can see the values there. It's quite large. And we have nice log transformed values that are a little more workable. All right. The next thing we want to do is we want to look at how many proteins we have. So this... Uh, awesome. Let's see. Okay, this little seven looking fellow up here in the second panel to the right that my mouse is circling. You want to go ahead and hit that and that'll give you Venn diagram options. And again, as before, all we want to do is we want to move over the LFQ intensity for L1 through 4 and R1 through 4 as well. And that gives us a very nice output telling us how many unique proteins we have in, or sorry, rather, yeah. How many proteins we have identified in each group? So, sorry, not unique proteins. There is overlap in this case, um, at least in this plot. So we can see here for the numbers we have. So for L1, we have 3,307 proteins. Things to look out for here. It's a good idea to make sure that you have a fairly similar number of proteins between all of your groups. Again, it depends on, there, there might be cases where you don't but make sure that the numbers you see here make sense for your analysis, right? If you did three, say three runs with club CL and ammonia, and you had like 3,000, 3,001 with like 200, and you didn't know why, you probably wanna go back and make sure some, everything was good in analysis or exclude the sample, kind of figure out what happened there, because that's not normal. We generally, this is generally pretty consistent between runs. Um, down here, this plot is not quite as user friendly, but what you can do with it is it shows you um, which proteins were identified in which runs. Um, yeah, which, which can be good for doing certain things. Um, yeah, I will leave it at that, but it exists there. All right, yeah, and then we can filter this in different ways. So by clicking total, um, you can also filter it on the right by the number of proteins. So order them in, in number of proteins. So we see in this case, um, or sorry, this is in descending order, but same idea. So 3,358 on L3 was the highest number of proteins that we had, or sample with highest number of proteins. All right, the next thing we wanna do is on the top, we wanna go up to filter rows and come down to filter rows based on valid values. And generally this is, so in this case we have four replicates. We're gonna say that we need a minimum number of three valid values. And we want to reduce matrix. If values obviously should be valid. What this is doing is this is saying we want a protein to be identified in at least three of the four runs 
in order for us to include it in our analysis. This is definitely something you can play with. Generally, you want more than 50% identification. So if you did 10 runs, you'd want it in six or more runs. Definitely, that's something you can play with based on your analysis, what you're trying to do. Um, there's kind of no super hard and fast rule. All right, so that'll filter to only give us proteins which are identified in at least three of the samples. The next thing we want to go do is go again on the top bar to annotate rows and go to categorical annotation of rows. What this allows us to do is to name our rows because generally working all the way through, you don't want to be trying to figure out what LFQ intensity L1 is. You can name it whatever the actual experiment is. Also for grouping. So um, in this case, we want to group like our L, L1 through 4 and R1 through 4 together. You can assign them to their respective groups um, for further data analysis. Okay, so that's great. So if we think now back to our log transform. So there, there in our data set, there were, there were some values are zero. We can't log transform zero. So even though we may not see it in our first, in this case, 22 proteins, there are some values in here that just say NAN, right? Because it was reported as an intensity of zero. We performed a log transform. It did it and said, well, can't do that. That's not a number. It's now an NAN. So this goes back to imputation that we were talking about. So there's a number of ways you can do this. So um, you want to go to imputation up here. Where are we at? Right there. Imputation up there. And generally, we go to replace missing values from a normal distribution. So that's what I was talking about with the downshifted distribution taking from the tail. Again, you very much can do this in different ways, right? We have missing values by constant impute all missing values with NAN. There's no, this is the way we do it. There's no perfect way, I suppose. All right, yeah, and then this should be by default, but we go with a width of 0 0.3 and a downshift of 1.8 for the distribution we're imputing from. Um, to what Bri asked, so this says separately for each column, so you can set it also like separately for each row. However, you want it to calculate this distribution that it's going to have width and downshift. That's how you calculate where the median of that distribution sits. And as with everything else, you pull over the rows you want to do it for. Sorry, I realize I'm stepping too far from the computer. Um, in this case, again, it's the LFQ intensity for your samples. All right, and then that gives us our nice imputed data set that we can now start to do a couple of things with. So one of the first things we generally like to do is we like to go to column correlation. And again, we pull out the same deal. We pull over our LFQ intensity. In this case, you can specify which row and column, col column combinations you want to pull over. But it's almost always just going to be your experimental groups. And this gives us a correlation matrix. So this is basically a measurement of how much do different columns have in common with each other, right? Or column, yeah. And that is, in the bigger picture, how much do our different samples have in common with each other? So you can represent this numerically. It's a little bit of a mess to just kind of look at a bunch of numbers. So a much nicer way to represent this is through a heat map. So you can go up here to should be in the top panel, this little uh, branching dendrogram icon. And we, we're going to now set up a heat map to actually view that correlation plot. So um, we can set our distances for both the columns and rows. If you guys are familiar with generation of dendrograms, there's diff different ways to generate the dendrogram from greatest distance, least distance. In this case, Euclidean is the default, but you can certainly use other methods. Um, Again, as with anything else, just have a reason to do it. Um, yeah, things like number of clusters. Again, generally this is left to default, but if you really did want to adjust these things for any reason, you certainly could. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's very easy. Just, uh, you know, uh, I didn't know 
use methods because you know when you want to create a graph, some of the data, you know, most people they use special kind of linkage. That's why you know I wanted to make sure what you based on your experience, you know, which way is the best. So, okay. I hesitate to say best, right? Because yeah. best is very subjective, but we almost use, almost always use Euclidean. So I would say it's a good default if for, if you know something about your data or know something about the type of information you're trying to get out of your data, you certainly can use one of the others, but Euclidean is, is a fairly safe bet in the standard. What about distance? Oh, sorry, the language, sorry. <laughs> um, oh, is average. Again, for average, you have yeah, and again, I would say pretty much the same idea. So average would be the standard. Certainly, if you had a reason to use one of the different methods, you certainly could. I would say at this stage, right, because all of the information is really contained here, it's just how you want to present it, right? Is there something about your data that makes sense for you to use a different method of presentation? Then certainly do that. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, yeah, I would say it very much depends on how you want to present it. Yeah. And is there any way to uh, have our data and for example use the other packages you know, like clusters, you know, to make our data? Uh, you know, yeah. Because for example, in our lab, you know, my supervisor has clusters, you know, that's why I want to think if I can just have, you know, my matrix, you know, I can just transfer it and use the other packages. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So there's there's an option to just export matrix and you can export it as like a CSV or a TSV or whatever export format you want to do and bring it into R or whatever software you might be using. Yeah. No worries. Um, but yeah, so that gives us this nice heat map looking at our column correlation that we have calculated. So again, really quick to highlight with going back to kind of general Perseus. So let me go back. Whichever matrix you have clicked on will be highlighted. And then whichever matrix is highlighted from you clicking on, that's where um, that's the matrix that whatever you ask for will be executed on. So in this case, um, down here, there'd be a matrix that is the matrix with the column correlations in it. You'd highlight it. And then there's your little dendrogram icon up there. All right. Yeah. And that gives us a nice plot to view column correlation. Um, yeah. And we can also have our scale. So you can see numerically what the relationship is between the different column correlations or between the different columns, rather. And the other nice thing, so this is the on in Perseus over, sorry. <laughs> All right. I'm trying really hard. <laughs> <laughs> In Perseus, we have the actual matrix over on this side, and then it creates this nice little box for us in the bottom of the matrix whenever we perform a visualization. So we can still get the, to the actual matrix here that is the column correlations, and then we could click on this little uh, sub box there to view the visualization. And then, of course, there is coloring options. If you want to make your um, your stuff look fancy, you can certainly uh, change the change the scale colors on Perseus. Um, I know red, blue, and white is popular for like um, visualization for like colorblind accessibility. So certainly there's lots of options there. You're not stuck to the red and green. And yeah, see it's changed there to the to the blue and red. All right, and so we can, can repeat this process again, except this time if we select our matrix matrix with all of our proteins in it instead of the column correlation we can create a heat map with all of our protein intensities. And that's that guy over there. We can follow the same process. We can, oh, yeah, we could change the, um, the scale colors for that if we wanted. This is a really, really nice way to visualize kind of the overall protein profile similarity between different, um, between different samples and seeing if there's certain hotspots, certain kind of subpopulations of proteins that are, really upregulated or really downregulated comparatively in different uh, different experiments or different um, treatment groups. All right, so we already talked about principal component analysis, but Perseus gives us tools to do that as well. So if we highlight again, this would be on our matrix with all of our proteins in it. We can go to this little dot cluster 
looking icon up here, which is our principal component analysis. It'll bring us up this window. Um, we want to keep everything as default, and that will give us this. So it will generate two PCAs. Actually, one has the individual proteins clustered. You could certainly look at that one. I generally don't use that one as much. We're mostly interested in this guy up here. So what we're looking at is if, if we were to click on these individual icons up here, forward. oh, nice, okay, awesome. So we can click on, if we go to the categories tab, so right now we're on points. If we instead go over to categories, this is if we think back to our grouping, right? Our annotate groups, we annotated them limited and replete. So we can click on limited and we can see, oh, nice, cool. All of our limited is grouped down here, meaning all of our repletes are up there, which is what we're looking for. Our sample separation is based on our experiments, not on, on random chance or something else. This can also be really good, especially if you have like larger, more complex data sets for identifying potential outliers. Um, it's definitely not like the be all and end all, but it can be a nice kind of temperature check for saying, all right, is this one like sitting way, way out here? If one, if one thing's contributing to like 98% of your variance and all your other samples are clustered in the corner, you might want to look at potentially removing that sample. All right, yes, and of course we can do a lot of stuff to make it look a lot nicer. So these options up here, we can do things like change the font size or change if the icon's filled in or what the icon looks like, which gives us nice, much nicer things to look at for visualization or for, um, for publications, things like that. So same plot, just, just a little prettier. Right. Uh, the PDF icon up here, you can also hit that and export to um, PDF or JPEG or whatever format you like to be able to slot into your report or whatever you're doing. All right. Another thing is volcano plots. So volcano plots are very, very good for giving us an idea of what's changing on kind of the whole proteome scale in terms of individual proteins. So again, this would be with clicked on our protein matrix with all of our pro individual proteins in it. We can go up to volcano plot up here, which is in the same kind of mid, mid panel on Perseus, mid top panel. And that'll give us this nice dialog box here. So a couple of things to look at here, because we only have two groups, everything should be, um, nothing should be able, should need to be changed too much, but you want to make sure that the two groups you want to compare are here, it tells you which, which one's going to be on the right which one's gonna be on the left. Um, you can also have other subgroupings if you want, if you have like an experiment with a bunch of subgroups in it. Here we just have grouping one, but again, that would be done through that um, categorical annotation. You could set like subgroups if you wanted. Um, so t-test is what we want. That's standard for here, um, side both. So one-sided versus two-sided t-test, both we're testing both directions. Um, number of randomizations, we generally leave that as it is. Um, FDR, so family false discovery rate to 0 0.05. Again, you certainly could change this based on what you're doing. 5% is the standard. And this S0 value we change to one. If you think back, that is our um, full change. We want a full change of two, but we're working with the log transform. So on the actual plot, that's a value of one for S0 here. And this is what is generated. So um, again, this will show as like a little box in the corner of the matrix for visualization. And we can see these individual dots as proteins. And these lines are our volcano plot lines for significance. So in this case, we can see we do have um, most proteins don't show a significant change. However, there are some up in the top right here that do show a significant change. You'll see on, when you click on the volcano plot on the right hand side of Perseus, a little dialog box will open up that will show you a couple things. Um, these are the individual calculated values for the protein. So your log P value, the actual difference, and it will have a little plus in this column if it is significant. So you can sort, it's nice for finding them, you can sort by all the proteins that are significant. If you click them here, show, no. 
if you click them here, then they will highlight individually, or you can also click them on the plot itself and then go back and they, the entry will be highlighted in the matrix on the side. Um, and you can go and investigate the more, the protein ID and things like that will also be included in there. So you know what protein is. That's pretty good information to have. All right. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. So you can see kind of our entire workflow over here. So we've gone down, we've done our filtering. Sorry, we've done our filtering. That is our, whoop. that's where we looked at proteins there. We did our categorical annotation, filtered based on row. We're working with kind of, we've done everything to it. This is where we're doing our volcano plots, things like that. Then one down below here, you can also see our column correlation. And this would be the matrix that had all of that information in it as well. So from there, we've kind of gone through the Perseus pipeline. We figured out what proteins, so we've filtered our data, we've kind of cleaned our data up. We have an idea of what proteins change significantly. So where do we go from here? So a great first step, if you say ha if you have a few proteins that you've noticed are up or down regulated or show other things of interest in your experiment is going to Uniprot. Uh, how familiar in general or have, has, how many people have used Uniprot in some capacity? Okay, so most of you are at least familiar with what it is. So Uniprot is a database containing prote protein information. So it, there's a couple of ways we can search in Uniprot. And we discussed downloading a FASTA file from Uniprot yesterday for the max quant section. But we can also go in and search for individual proteins and see what information there is for those proteins. So, for example, from max quant, if we saw, okay, this protein's different, we could find the protein identifier in that little table on the right from the volcano plot and put the protein identifier into Uniprot. So, for example, here. And we can search that, and it will give us inf as much information as there is on the protein. So, example gives us the gene name, um, the status. So, if it's been reviewed by Swiss Prod or if it's been reviewed or um, verified by anyone, evidence for the protein, um, the uh, the full protein name. So, something um, that sometimes confused me when I was first figuring this out is as far as Uniprot's concerned, there's kind of three ways to identify a protein. So there's this guy here, which is the protein accession number or identifier. That's the J9VQO3. It's just a unique identifier. There's also the way it names the protein or kind of short forms the protein. So in this case, NOG2 and then another string. And then there's the actual protein name. So nuclear GTP binding protein 2. All right, so I think we're going to take a break for coffee. Okay, so for the uh, for the last lecture portion of today, I we're going to, I'm going to use it as an opportunity to to show you some data visualization strategies. Uh, there are ways that we visualize data in the lab, and, and just to get you thinking about it, you'll have a little bit of time this afternoon to work in Perseus and and start uh, going through the steps that Ben had walked through. But then also tomorrow morning, you'll have an opportunity to do uh, the module four and module five labs in the morning. And so please like take that time to do it. We'll, we'll do that here and help to answer questions. But as you go through and you're using Perseus, think about some of these strategies that have how we present the data and be creative. This is really your chance to take what we have and say, I can do better than that and do it. And then like, please share it. We like, it's great to see how uh, people interpret things differently, how they visualize different colors, all that kind of stuff. It all really applies. Uh, so I start off very uh, basic here. And, and this also feeds back into the concept of how are you presenting your data or where are you presenting your data? If you're doing more of a biological presentation or a biological uh, publication in that focus, then the way you present your data may be more intuitive to a biologist than perhaps uh, all volcano plots or the T-SNE plots. They look amazing, but a biologist may look at them and say like, okay, and not because they, they don't appreciate it or know how to interpret it, but because it's not how they would typically see data presented in publications. And that is a hurdle that you may face when you present things in a heat map or in a volcano plot. If your field presents them in a different way, 
that is something that you may encounter as feedback. And so it's, it's, I love pushing the boundaries of how fields see data, but also still respecting how it will be interpreted. And so here I have very simple, this is like a Venn diagram, kind of from simple to more increasing. Here, this is a circle. This is not a Venn diagram, it is a circle. I generated this in PowerPoint. So it's very high end uh, work. The idea here is just to show protein numbers, right? It's, it's just a simple concept to visualize instead of just putting a number in text, having something like this within a diagram or within a figure as a nice visualization. Here we do have a Venn diagram. This would be one that we would put below a volcano plot, for example, to show that these, these are the ones that are not significantly different, are part of the core proteome, and then maybe you have ones that are significantly different on either side of the volcano plot. Uh, another way to show Venn diagrams, I don't have an example on here, but is size proportionate. So you may have one that is a little bit smaller if the number is smaller and a little bit larger. You can change it that way too. It seems like a simple thing, and yet you'd be amazed at how like how standard some of them are or how often they're used. So, and then I have with the other, I'm trying to pull up the laser pointer. Hmm. Okay. Uh, with the other one here, more complex Venn diagram, and these can be scripts taken like with an R or Python and different tools used so that you can really compare more of a complex data set. And within these, within the middle there, you have the 2300. We could define that as a core proteome, kind of a buzz term that is used. It will, is one that proteins are common to all of the comparisons. And then you can kind of tease apart what is unique or common to the different ones. So it just gets a bit more complex. Other examples are such as the upset plot, and this sometimes is complemented with a bar graph above or just the dots as well. It, it depends on how you want to present the data, but it's the concept of a Venn diagram in a different mode. And so here you can see in the first column are all the proteins. There's 243 that are found across all of these samples, across all the organs in this case. And then it kind of steps through where ones are unique or common to different ones. So it's the same concept as the Venn diagram, uh, more, I would say, perhaps visual and not as intuitive, but gives you a lot more information as well, where you can start to see what is common and different, how many proteins, those sorts of pieces. And so uh, those are other ways to visualize the data. We also sometimes use what I call egg diagrams. This is two ovals on top of each other. And I don't say that to you in a, in a way that like, obviously you don't know. I say it in a way of how we can do things very simply. It doesn't need to be really complex. And we do this for a lot of our multi-species work. So in some of our publications where we have uh, dual species or something, we will use such a plot to show the uh, majority, say the host proteome and the proteins that are identified in one system. And then we have another biological system identified as well. And it allows us to demonstrate to the reader in a biological sense that we're identifying proteins from both, bio both systems and there isn't overlap in them. But here are the numbers as to what our, what our um, coverage is of those systems. So kind of a way to think about it in that sense. Pie charts are also really uh, popular. They're a very qualitative look at the data. There's no like statistics behind most pie charts. I, but they allow you to see a representation or a visual of how things may change. So if you had uninfected or infected, you have different growth media. It's a quick visual way to see those differences. And then you can color it and tailor it to however you like. Ben had shown some of the heat maps, I call them correlation profiles. So these are ones that you can generate within Perseus. And they allow you to see the trends in the data. So you can look at the replicates and how they cluster. So here you get information on the clustering of your samples, how close the technical or biological replicates are. And then you can also see like about, like between comparisons too, how well they're related. This also allows you to calculate the replicate reproducibility. So when you generate uh, the column correlation, there's an output table that allows you to actually see what is the reproducibility amongst your replicates. And typically we'd like around 90%, give or take, that entirely depends on your samples that you're working with. And this is an example where you could go through and change those colors, as you saw in the Perseus slides, and optimize it and, and kind of customize it to what you would like. 
these hierarchical clusterings, this is based on protein intensity. So you'll see that there's clustering on the side. These are the protein IDs. And then we have our treatment condition on top. There's not the, uh, because it's not a column correlation, these are all of the proteins and their abundance is represented in this plot. So it's fairly semi-quantitative in the sense that you can see higher or lower, but there's no statistical comparison across any of your samples. But what it allows you to do is pull out trends in the data. And sometimes that's really powerful. When you want to, like a volcano plot will give you specific proteins, but say you wanted to talk about a general trend that you observe, this is a nice way to lead the reader into that direction. So we have a cluster of proteins here. They may come out as significantly different on a volcano plot. We can look into them more specifically later on. But in a general abundance, we can talk about how in this sample set, we have this cluster of proteins that are higher in abundance relative to your other ones. And if you zoom in, you can see what the protein names are, and you might be able to make some connections to them or, or have, you know, start to build a story around this semi-quantitative uh, look at your data. And so you can take a lot of things from these heat maps uh, and, and use them in different ways. Yes? To do what, sorry? Is that sort? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes. So we, these ones, as you, yeah, are the log two intensity. We also do some on Z score as well, especially if you want to subtract like a background or a, a baseline, then by all means, as long as you're transparent in how you represent it, you can plot however you like. Yes, yes, absolutely, yeah. So it really is on how, what story do you wanna convey with your data? Ben introduced the uh, concept, the principal component analysis. This is one of the most common ways I think that proteomics data is presented in an unbiased fashion to really get a look at what your data is telling you. And so this is generally the one of the first plots that we make when we look at our data sets, because it'll tell you is the distinction by biological conditions. So here we have a mutant strain and here we have a wild type strain. So it's good to know that the deletion of that particular gene drives some difference in the proteome. But then we can also see differences across our replicates. And so we have our wild type clustering quite nicely together. There's more separation here between our mutants but it's not a huge percentage that's accounting for that difference. And so you can, you can start to get some information from your data in an unbiased way. Yeah. So as far as I know, PCA is kind of a linear dimensionality reduction, whereas there are already like a lot of, well, basically a bunch of tools which do non-linear dimensionality reduction. It's also uh, Benjamin mentioned TSNI, mm -hmm. UMAP, topological data analysis, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As far as I understand during linear transformations, you may lose the information about your, well, multidimensional uh, relations between your objects. Is it that important in, in comparing the replicates? It can be. So depend. I would say it kind of depends on what your weighting is here in the components. If you had component one and comp component two accounting for less than 50%, there are other drivers in your data that you want to look at. And so you can look at other components as well. Like uh, in Perseids, you could map it to component two and component three, and you can kind of start to see that dimensionality in a sense. But you're right. This is a linear presentation. And if you're losing things here, then you may want to use the t sne plot or something else to bring more to it. Um, ben, is that yeah, pretty? No, right. Yeah, that covers. Yeah. And PCA is just relying on exactly that idea that your first two components are representing really the experiment the driver. So you don't care about more than that. But as you have more dimensions, absolutely, you want to visualize those dimensions as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how to extract the features of the, the components? Ah, so this one here, um, the way that I look at it is the data tells you what those features are. So in like, for example, in Perseus, you have your sample. So you would have each of these dots and you can look at the categories and you will see where they map. So for example, this is a more complex PCA plot. So when you look at this, I do not know what the features are off the start. But once I start to look at the data and label what the samples are, then I can decide, I can define the fact that along component one, we have a time dependent feature. So we have our 24 hour samples in circles clustering, 
and we have our 120 hours clustering in the squares. So time is one of our separating factors. If we look along component two, we have mock, and then we have different treatment groups. And that's where we see separation as well. And so we, we cannot look at it and say, like, this is the feature uh, without looking into the data a little bit more and knowing what the samples are as well. I think that's one of the, I would say the values in these plots is because when you when you put this up and, you, and it's all just like circles that are open and you think like, oh my goodness, what happened? Like, this is terrible, my experiment didn't work, I don't have nice clusters. But once you start to tease it apart, it, it can be quite nice. So, and this is actually from plant data, which are notoriously challenging. It's a really nice data set. So that's why I put the PCA up there. But you, but you do need to look into it. You need to see what are the components driving these uh, visualizations. Uh, ben introduced the T-SNE plot. Uh, these are ones that were generated, I believe, in R outside of uh, Perseus. And so they take into account more of that dimensionality. Personally, I find they take more time for me to look at and tease apart what all the factors are, but you can start to see trends in the data just as you do with a PCA. You can see where you have some samples clustering, like these ones down here, which is, represents the spinal cord. We have our replicates clustering across time points. So we have our earlier time point, we have a mid and then an end time point as well that are clustering there. That was a nice one that kind of teases, that comes apart. Whereas you can see others are not as easily separated. And that tells us too about the proteomes of these particular organs and how they relate to each other or how they differ from each other as well. And so this can be another way to represent more complex data sets perhaps and get that dimensionality. For volcano plots, I'll put up the, because Ben had gone through these, I'll put up the labels. And so I, you'll see in proteomics data, a lot of volcano plots. And the reason why is everything outside of those curved lines are statistically significantly different. And they are represented as the corrected p-value. So we have the FDR corrected p-value. And you can look at uh, individual proteins uh, that are either on either side. And you, you wanna keep in mind your full differences, your uh, positive and minus values. When you're working in Perseus and you have a volcano plot, uh, you'll notice the, the right hand side is positive and it'll say right hand and the left hand is negative. And you want to keep that in mind because as you're doing your data analysis, if you don't think about that and you flip them, then your proteins will be in opposite directions. So just keep in mind which side of the plot your samples are sitting on. And so you'll see lots of volcano plots. You'll also see a lot of proteins here. So how do we start to look at individual ones without cherry picking? That's one of our challenges in proteomics is that we have so much data, we don't know where to start. So there's different ways to visualize uh, volcano plots. You could, so this is an example of one of my students' theses, uh, the images from there. No one wants to look at this many volcano plots. I love them and I don't wanna look at that many. So we think about ways that we can be creative in presenting all of this data. And one of the ways that we do this in the lab is through uh, these kind of dot plots. And so, it is, this is using graph pad prism and the number of proteins that are significantly different. So the one, the significantly different proteins on either side of the volcano plot are represented as either positive being on the right hand side or they're negative being on the left hand side of the plot. And so what you see here are just changes in numbers and it allows you more of that global overview of what is happening in your volcano plots. So in the first ones, for example, we have uh, like 500 proteins on either side, give or take, that are significantly different. But then as you do the different comparisons, that gets larger and larger. And that is all within the first cluster of four. If we look at the next side, you see that the differences start much higher. So it's, it's more of a, I would say, kind of a quick way to get your mind around the data. And then if you wanted to have volcano plots or lists of proteins within an appendix or a supplemental file, you can provide all that information. But as a visual here, you can see the same data as is represented within all these volcano plots. So it's kind of those strategies that you, you know, I encourage people to be creative on and think about what, how do you want to present your data and how can you communicate it effectively? I, this would be a more effective way for us to talk about all this data within a, within a presentation, for example, and, and get through it a little bit faster. 
So another way that we do that we look at volcano plots sometimes is called we call them stacked volcano plots. And this is where we actually take two volcano plots that have the same axes and put them on top of each other. And the idea behind this is that the if you so this one here has a treated and untreated and a different treatment and untreated. So there's two variables that are being compared, but we want to look at things that are common between those uh, volcano plots. So you could put them up individually. You could subtract a background with a Z score and present it that way. Or here's a visual where the ones that are uh, filled are identified in both as significantly different. And the proteins that are open were only identified as significantly different in one of the comparisons. So it kind of, it drives the reader to then you can say, these are the ones that we want you to look at. These are our proteins of interest because they were common in both of our analyses. And so it, it's one of the ways to kind of subtract the background without minimizing its importance, I would say. And this is done, I, um, I have not found a package to do this. So I do this like more manually. You can generate your volcano plots, map the, have the axes the same, and then I just put them on top of each other. It's, it's not very fancy. That's how I do it. If you have a better way, that would be awesome. Yes. Yes, yeah. So, well, you would provide the interpretation, of course, for your readers in like a figure legend. But essentially, like you can have open circles are ones that are unique to each of the comparisons. And filled circles are those that are common to your comparison at a significant level, that sort of thing. The colors would then represent one treatment over another. And the gray represents your control group, something like that. Yeah. And you can label it as much as you like. Within a manuscript, we would probably label... Uh, we followed up on one of these proteins, we would label that one so that the reader sees exactly what, what we're going to talk about further on without losing any of the other data. We're still showing them the whole picture of what's happening. Okay. Yeah. Uh, some other strategies for visualizing data, which is more in that se semi-quantitative look, uh, is looking at patterns of protein production. And so in Perseus, there is a little trend plot uh, option there. And what it allows you to do is the gray lines represent all of the protein intensities across your samples. And then we have selected a feature that we would like to highlight or a pattern that we would like to highlight. So in particular here, we're looking at uh, proteins, a host protein that decreases in abundance uh, between the uninfected and the infected versus a host protein uninfected to infected that increases in abundance. The ones that we've chosen are those that we know are involved in uh, in infection or an immune response for this particular example. So we've taken a positive control and we've mapped its production, its pattern with across the data sets. We then can use a Pearson correlation to look for other proteins that have that same pattern and to identify what they are. And so it allows you to start to see trends in your data uh, we've done this uh, with one of Ben's papers for looking at uh, biomarkers, putative biomarkers, from both the host side and the pathogen side. So we know that we have some host proteins that could be biomarkers, and now we want to come up with more of a comprehensive signature. And so you can see these are other proteins that show that same pattern, and what are they? If you're interested in the biology of those ones, you could also then look and see, are they regulated by the top protein? Are they involved in it? Why is the pattern the same? So it, it, it gives you a nice, um, I would say, opportunity to explore the data further as well. Yeah, so you can average them across replicates or you could do it individually as well. Typically we average and then, uh, and then we plot, but it doesn't show you average or standard deviation. That's why it's semi-quantitative. You can get all that data though, and you could use it within the, the story or the manuscript. Uh, but for our visual, it, this one is the average. You could also do it where you don't average. And then maybe you want to see across the replicates what the trends are. That would be possible as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you said you use you know, this uh, graph for the predictive point marker, yes? Right. Yes. Uh, yeah. just, I wonder how you figure it out. You know, you found many proteins, but now you have different categories. For example, the group is related to antimicrobial, uh, you know, peptide, mm -hmm. the other is for 
the other groups. Mm -hmm. How do you figure it out? For example, this group of proteins, which you make it to this pathway or this mechanism, you know, and how you know, the other one is related to the others, you know, how do you find the pathway or function of you know, your protein? Yes. First, yeah. And then yeah. You create this graph. yeah. So I think it kind of depends on what you're looking at and your familiarity with the samples as well as the tools available. So uh, before the break, Ben had talked about Uniprot and how you could put your protein ID in there. If you put your protein ID in there and you find information that's involved in immune signaling or in, in a particular cascade, that can give you information to then know what it is doing and some functional information. Well, tomorrow we'll look at string networks to look at interactions between proteins. That could be another way as well. Uh, some of them, depending on if it's in, like for immune signaling cytokines, we may be interested in cytokines. So that would be a place where we would start. And we could use that as a kind of positive control to map the pattern and see what else follows that same pattern. Yeah. I'm asking this because I know some people, they just check the database, yes. you know? Yes, yeah, and yeah. For, I don't know, for example, I sick in the paper, mm -hmm. I see some people, they do uh, gene set enrichment analysis mm -hmm. you know, to see how you know, these genes you know, will be enriched in some part. I wanted to see if the proteins have this kind of you know, special, I don't know, uh, methods or you know category which is used for the protein. Yeah, so yeah. That's what I'm Yes, yes. So uh, tomorrow I will I will show like a bit of string is one way to do it. Uh, also keg mapping, you can map proteins to that as well. And it will show you the pathways and where they are. And, and you can label them according to abundance if you want to. So yeah, yeah, those are great tools that you can use to kind of characterize it a bit more. Thank yeah, thanks. Yeah. Is it Yes, yes. I have not used G-profile. Yes. Yeah. That's very excellent. So yes, there are many tools and there's and it's great to like use different ones and integrate different ones as well. Uh, some other ideas that we use for uh, presenting data is if you wanted to uh, look at a, a family of proteins. So these uh, are generated in GraphPad Prism. And here we're looking at all the proteins that are within a specific category. That could be based on the gene ontology. That could be based on signaling cascade, defense response. You can be quite, it, it's up to you what you would like to define them as. Uh, you could look at all uh, proteases, for example, or all kinases, and look to see what is the abundance and plot them. And here then we've done a comparison between that uh, category of proteins and looking at the changes in the abundance under different conditions. So it kind of, I would say it complements your volcano plots because it allows you to, uh, to still um, maybe see what the general trend is uh, and then focus on individual ones too, if you like. Or if you want to, it's really about your story as well and your data. If you want to, you know, focus the reader in on a specific um, category of proteins or certain gene ontology terms, this is one way that you can do it. You can show them these comparisons uh, from your from your entire data set too. And so within Perseus, uh, tomorrow, like a little bit today, and then of course tomorrow morning, you'll be able to work with some of these plots and generate them. Uh, get a graph pad prism, you can also get a uh, free trial from as well. So you can take some of the data uh, from Perseus and move it into there. We've also, uh, I had a master of bioinformatics student in my group that um, developed Proteo Plotter. And this is a kind of plugin for Perseus that uh, Esther has developed. And the idea is that we take Perseus output and then you can use those files in a different format, uh, in a different pipeline to generate different, different figures. So Perseus does a lot of really great things, but it doesn't get all the way for some of the analysis that we do in the lab. And so Esther has built a tool uh, to do that. And we do have, uh, it is in our GitHub and I can, I can share that. It's not publicly available yet. We haven't uh, published it and launched it fully, but people in my group are using it for their analysis and kind of tweaking it and testing it out. And so this is just a visual of it and it really is a complementation platform to some of the Perseus tools. We are designing it in collaboration with Jurgen Cox's group so that they also provide input into what they would like Perseus to do, but haven't had time to do it. 
So we're trying to, to supplement that. So there's a 1D annotation heat maps. There are, we have volcano plots that you can do a bit more um, uh, visualizations, uh, color changes, different things like that. Uh, PCA plots with the ellipses, if you like to want to see that clustering. There's dynamic range plots. I have an example of those. And so these are plots that, um, that look across, we've talked in DDA and DIA about dynamic range and how you want to detect high abundant proteins and low abundant proteins. And these dynamic range plots are a way to visualize that. So you can see across different experiments, maybe different instruments, uh, the range of proteins that you're detecting. For the most part, these are all very similar in their abundance. We do see under some of our conditions here, a slightly um, greater detection of the low abundance proteins. And so we can then go in and look at that compared to some of these and see what are those proteins that we're detecting with one instrument over another. So it starts to, uh, it's another way to visualize kind of that, the coverage of the proteome that you're achieving in your. Uh, this is a feature within Perseus that you can, that you can work towards. There's also a publication on it from Jurgen's group. And the concept behind it is that you're taking all the data from a volcano plot. And instead of looking at individual proteins, you're looking at the category that those proteins fall in. So it can be based on gene ontology, biological processes, cellular compartment, keywords, molecular function. You can select the categorical annotation, and but you're looking at how the proteins change. So for example, here we have uh, pathogenesis related proteins. We have an alpha amylase inhibitor, and this is the gene ontology uh, or the keyword category. And we can go back into Perseus and we can see what are the proteins that fall within this category. So this is a nice way for that kind of high level view of your data set, which then you could have a reader look at this and you could say, the ones in red here are higher in our treated than our untreated, or the proteins are enriched within this category in our treated versus untreated. And then these are the proteins in that category. So you can kind of lead them in with a story by starting very global. And then you could supplement it with a volcano plot if you like to show here's the exact abundance differences and then so forth. So it gives you opportunities. Um, another consideration is on volcano plots, you may not have any significantly different proteins. That's always very disappointing. You map your volcano plot and there's nothing that comes up as different. This is a way to get around that. Sometimes you can look at the category of proteins and you can see enrichment that can give you something to talk about. So uh, we will do this oftentimes with collaborators if they send us samples and then there's just nothing changes or it's not clean enough for us to see individual proteins, but we can still work with the data. You can always do something with it. That's, that's my motto. So, uh, so just a, a brief overview of some of the ways to visualize it. Uh, the slides are there in Perseus. You can go through the, the different um, uh, screenshots that we've provided, but also please feel free to just try things out. Click buttons and see what happens. What image do you generate? How far do you get? Uh, there's great documentation. There's the Max Plot Summer School YouTube videos. There's a lot of power in what you can visualize using using this. And then if you want to take it to R and you want to take those output files, like that's that's excellent. That's what we want to see. And so I now I want to show just an example of where we've used some some of this data. So this is the recent publication from my group uh, where we compared DDA and DIA in the host pathogen uh, interaction space. And here we started with the general workflow. And the reason we do this is to provide context so that if our reader is from a biological perspective, they can see how we are treating the samples and then they can see our, our entire pipeline. If they're from more of a technological perspective, then it may familiarize them with our biological side while still giving them data on the purpose of what we're doing. So I don't know for publications if you generally put workflows in, but it is something that we tend to do uh, to really make the story accessible to both sides, depending on the reader and where we're publishing. So in this diagram here, we've got our, our egg diagrams. So it's, it's a stacking plot, essentially, showing the number of host proteins and then fungal proteins and bacterial proteins. So it's a very nice way to visualize the data and just see the numbers from the beginning. We've incorporated bar plots here of the total protein number 
And uh, you could do the same thing with peptides. I know there's a question yesterday about peptides versus proteins. Similar maps can be used to, uh, to show the number of either one, two. Here we have uh, some of like a, the Venn diagram space where this particular one shows that we identified everything using uh, DIA and then a smaller subset with DDA. We have uh, complemented biological information on here. So these are generating graph pad prism and uh, looking at CFU counts. Here we're doing, we're mapping changes in the abundance across sample sets. So we're taking all of the protein abundance profiles in each of the conditions and looking at the significant differences of that category across the, across the comparison. In this one, we have kind of a combination of many different pieces. So we have our PCA plot. And when we look at the PCA plot, when it doesn't have no labels on it or any colors on it, uh, we don't know what the distinction is. Once we add those labels and colors, we can see that we have uninfected and infected are, is our component one driver. And then component two is based on the burden of infection. So it starts at a lower burden and then goes up to the higher burden. And so the PCA plot is telling us how our proteome is remodeled or how it's different across the conditions. This is on the side there, we have our dot plot representing all the different volcano plots. So you'll see some of them all hover around the zero. So either they had no significantly different proteins or very few significantly different proteins. And instead of putting the volcano plots up, we show this here to see that when there is a huge difference, what are the conditions? So visually you can see uh, where it really matters in this particular analysis. And then this one here is just a rough trend diagram. So we've looked at the trend in fungal proteins as they've increased during infection and during the uninfected. And so it allows us, again, just to see which, which proteins are following that same trend. And then I have an example of a string network on the side, and, and I'll show more of that tomorrow. I, but different ways to highlight categories of proteins that we want to then talk about. And so for this particular paper, we were interested in the proteasome because of the biology component to it. So then we followed up, kind of zooming in on that, and complementing it with different bio biology pieces. So really tailoring it to your audience, um, using your different figures and thinking about who's going to see them, how are they going to interpret them, how do you want them to be interpreted? I think that's one of the key pieces in proteomics that you have the power over uh, that you can control within your uh, presentation of the data itself. 